Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Refuge Church online gathering. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. Let's call ourselves to worship this morning from Psalm 103, which says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this morning to be able to gather together at least virtually. We pray that You'd speak to us now through these songs and through Your Word. In Jesus' name. Amen.
love could remember No wrongs we have done I'm missing all knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience, what patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Thank you for singing with us. Let's turn our attention now to Holy Scripture. And we'll be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. And as you're turning there, let me bring you up to speed if you're just joining us for the first time. Philippians is a letter written by the ancient missionary and apostle extraordinaire Paul to a group of struggling Christians in the city of Philippi to encourage them in their faith, to shepherd them, to pastor them from afar. And as he is doing that by the help of the Holy Spirit, he is certainly still doing that today for us. There'll be three points to guide us on our journey today, and I believe that they will be a great encouragement to us. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and illuminate these texts to us. We pray that we'd be informed in our knowledge of Scripture, transformed by the renewing of our minds, conformed to the image of Christ, and recommissioned on the Great Commission. Lord, help me, frail as I am, to serve us well in this time. In Jesus' good name, amen. Well, just like last week, we'll be picking up right where we left off. 
Let's pick up the trail in verse 12. It says this, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. And so the first Bible study kind of question we need to ask ourselves here is what is the this that he is referring to? And of course, this underscores the importance for us of reading the Bible in context, because this goes back to what we learned last week. He's talking about the perfect state of perfection that would accompany our resurrection bodies that we will receive in glory. And he's saying, listen, I'm on the road there. You're on the road there if your faith is in Jesus, but... I'm not there yet. I've not, ready, I've not already obtained this or I'm already perfect. So Paul shows a great deal of humility here, shows a great deal of wisdom here in how he communicates, but he also shows a great deal of savvy here because what he's also doing is he's taking the language that his opponents have used, probably these Judaizers, because they have been expounding upon how they have already reached this state of perfection how they have arrived, and he's contrasting himself and, of course, the biblical view with their false teaching view. He's saying, listen, none of us in this life have gotten there yet. None of us has arrived. None of us have already obtained this or are already perfect. And so Paul is very carefully correcting false teaching and countering it with the truth. And in the meantime, he says, here's what we need to be about until we get to that place. Look at the next verse. It says, but I press on <coughs> to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And this isn't very clear in the English, but in the original Greek in which this was written, this is very highly emotive and visceral, tangible language. It carries with it, one writer says, almost a sense of violence. This language comes from the world of war, and athletics, and it carries with it the notion of seizing something. In fact, one writer uh, talked about the ancient historian Herodotus. He used the same word that Paul used to describe an army's pursuit and seizure of retreating columns of the enemy. So there's been a battle, the guys are running away, and the, the, the victorious army chases them down and grabs them. That's, that's the verb that Paul is using here. And in so doing, this leads us to our first point, and that is that our pursuit of Jesus <coughs> is rooted in Jesus's pursuit of us. Our pursuit of Jesus is rooted in Jesus's pursuit of us. And friends, let me tell you something. This is very, very helpful to us because Paul goes back to his own conversion, to his own Damascus Road experience, and he calls to mind what it was like to have Jesus come along and grab him by the proverbial scruff of the neck, to grab him out of the life of persecuting the church, to instead proclaiming to the church, to bring him from darkness into light. And when we hear this, we can be encouraged to recall our own conversion. We can be encouraged to look back and say, hey, listen, God brought me out of terrible circumstances, spiritually, sometimes even practically, and look what he has done. He pursued me. He chased me. Just like C.S. Lewis said, he was the hound of heaven on my heels. And now look at what he's done in my life. So as we hear Paul think about his own conversion, we need to think about our conversion. Now, here's a second way that this will help us. It is also helpful because it reminds us of why we do what we do spiritually. Because there are going to be plenty of days that you don't want to get out of bed and read your Bible. You don't want to pray for people because you're tired. You don't want to serve others. And friends, we need to remember that anything we do for Jesus rests upon the foundation of all that Jesus has already done for us. We are not the first movers. We are simply the responders. We respond to what God has done. It's His Bible, His revelation to us that we read. It's His invitation that says to us, come, pray, let's talk about what's going on in your life. Let's, let me unburden you. All of that movement that we make is in response to the movement that God has made. Our pursuit of Jesus is rooted in Jesus' pursuit of us. So let me ask you this question this morning. Where do you most need that truth? 
Where do you most need to lean in and hear that call from God to come to Him, to be reminded of your conversion, to be reminded of the source of your strength, and to be encouraged on your path with Christ? Wherever that may be, friends, let's listen to the Holy Spirit as He writes that truth on our hearts today. Now, this notion that Paul has not arrived, it's so important to him that he restates it almost verbatim here in verse 13. Take a look at it. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And so this language that he uses here, one thing I do, he introduces a new metaphor. And it is the metaphor of a foot race. He uses this graphic present tense. This is something I'm doing right now. But then he also makes reference to the past and the future. And so Paul is making a very profound statement here, which actually leads us to our second point. And that is that pursuing Jesus rightly requires leaning forward and not looking back. I think this illustration will help us lay hold of what Paul is getting at here. On August 7th, 1954, one of the greatest foot race events in history took place. It was during the British Empire Games in Vancouver, Canada, and it was one of the quickest and most important mile run matchups that had ever been conducted. Some called it the Miracle Mile, and it included British Roger Bannister and Australian John Landy. They were the only two sub four minute milers in the world at the time, and in fact, Bannister had been the first man ever to run a four minute mile. Both of them were at the top of their game in peak physical condition, and Bannister's strategy was basically that he was going to try to lay back and relax as much as he could during the first part of the race and save everything he had for the finishing drive. But when they came on to the third lap, he had to make a change. Landy, the Australian, began to really pour on the gas, stretching his already substantial lead. So Bannister had to make a move or he would be completely left behind. So he cuts the lead in, the la in half, and at the bell for the final lap, they were neck and neck. But then Landy began running even faster. Bannister had to pick up speed even more. And that's when it happened. As they came onto the home stretch, there were so many people gathered there, the stadium was full of fans, Landy could no longer hear the footfall of Bannister behind him. So he turns ever so slightly a single glance to look for Bannister and it throws off his cadence. And in that moment, that's when Bannister makes his move. He blows past Landy because of this one lapse of concentration and runs on into running history, winning this uh, occasion, this race by five yards that day. And this moment has been played time after time after time on old celluloid film and in been in countless magazines. And what does it illustrate for us? That if you're going to run effectively, you have to focus on the finish line and not look back. And friends, in essence, that is what Paul is saying. Except he's not talking about a human foot race. He's talking about the spiritual race that everyone who follows Jesus is engaged in. And he's saying you've got to focus on the finish line. Focus on what lies ahead. Don't look back. Because if you do, you're going to get distracted. It's going to throw off your cadence. And it's going to mess up your race. So let's break this down with the language that he uses. So this one thing that he's talking about. The one thing that I do that is talking about the most important pursuit in his life, the pursuit of following Jesus. And then he breaks down linguistically. There's two ways, two practices that he engages in that we should subsequently follow that make that possible. Two ways to put proverbial feet on it. The first one is to forget what lies behind. And the second one is to strain forward to what lies ahead. Now, let's take the first one first. 
So when he says, forget what lies behind, he's not talking about some kind of blanket amnesia. In fact, Paul had a very wonderful memory. You can tell by all the people and places and theology that he recounts throughout his letters. He clearly believed in memory or, or, or remembering things. But what he is talking about here is what I would like to describe as a purposeful, strategic forgetfulness that applies to both his achievements and his failures. I like what the Expositor's Commentary says about this. They say, forgetting did not mean obliterating the memory of the past, but a conscious refusal to let it absorb his attention and impede his progress. Commentator O'Brien also says this that I found helpful. He will not allow either the achievements of the past which God had wrought, or for that matter, his failures as a Christian to prevent his gaze from being fixed firmly on the finish line. In this sense, he forgets as he runs. Isn't that a great image? He forgets as he runs. And so he's not saying, hey, don't learn from the past. Don't be benefited by the things that you've picked up along the way. He's saying don't be paralyzed by the past. Don't be fixated upon it. You've got to lean forward. You've got to strain forward. You've got to press in so that you might press on. And if you are too tied to the past, it will be like an anchor for you, not a foundation on which you can stand. And friends, this is not just a good example from Paul. This is an imperative spiritual skill that we need to pick up as well. Because aren't there temptations that we have to be too fixated on the past? There absolutely are. We can be tempted to think, oh man, remember the good old days when I was out there and sharing my faith and doing these things and so on? and we rest on our, lean on our laurels, so to speak, we don't want to be that kind of person spiritually. Let me give you an example of this. Some of you guys may remember the movie from, gosh, been quite some time now, feels like 15 years or so, of Napoleon Dynamite. And there is a wonderful character in there named Uncle Rico. And he is the quintessential guy that is trapped in his glory days from high school. So his current reality is he's living out in a field in a camper van, not a lot going on, but every time he engages with some of the other people in the movie, he's always talking about back in 1982, I could throw a pig skin a quarter mile. And there's some wonderful video of him trying to do that and all these different things. So funny, but he is the quintessential example of someone that is paralyzed by their past. Friends, we don't want to be that person spiritually. We don't want to think back to things that God did a long time ago and say that's as good as it gets. We want to be living with God now. We want to be seeing God reveal things in His Word to us now. We want to be out sharing our faith now. We want to be faithful to Jesus in the things that He's doing in our life now. We don't want to be spiritual or practical Uncle Rico's. We don't want to be paralyzed by the past. Now, there's a darker side to this as well. And this is being paralyzed by mistakes that we've made in the past. They could be sins that we committed. They could be bad business deals that we made. They could be financial mistakes that we made. They could be parenting mistakes that we thought we were doing the right thing at the time and then we find out later wasn't the best idea. And we can be so paralyzed by this past in the sense of regret that it contaminates our present and potentially derails our future. So we need to be very careful that we aren't paralyzed by the past in that way as well. We need to keep our eye on the prize, eye on the finish line. Be like Bannister. Run forward. Don't be like Landy. Don't look to the side. Don't look back. It throws off your cadence. We don't want to be spiritual Uncle Rico's, and we don't want to be paralyzed by the past. So let me ask you a question. Is that a problem for you today? Are you living too much in the glory days of yesteryear, and perhaps God is saying to you today, listen, 
I'm still the same God. I'm doing work now. I want you to be more involved in it now. Or are you maybe paralyzed by the past in a negative sense? Is there something going on now that you need to confess to the Lord? Is there some help that you need to get from brothers and sisters around you? What is God saying to you now about living in this moment with Him spiritually? And for those who particularly struggle with regret and sins of the past, in addition to Paul's profound example here, let me give you some additional good gospel news as well. Two big words that talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross. The first one is that Jesus is our propitiation. And what that means is that He is the full and appropriate payment for our sins. And friends, I want you to know today that no matter what you've done, Jesus' blood can cleanse it. If you will turn from your sins and trust in Him, if you will confess your sins to Him, He can forgive you. He will forgive you. And if you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, friends, remember the good news from 1 John 1, 9, that if we are faithful to confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. No exemption. So you don't have to be paralyzed by your past, no matter how sordid it is, because the blood of Jesus is the full and appropriate payment, the propitiation for your sin. Now, another big word here, because Jesus is also our expiation. And what that means is, is that Jesus died to cleanse us of all filth in every way. And sometimes what people are paralyzed with, it, it's not their own sin. It was the sin that was committed against them. It's the horrible thing that someone else did to them. It is the debilitating rape that they experienced or abuse of many kinds or maybe even some kind of betrayal. And friend, I want you to know that Jesus died to cleanse you. If those things happen to you, you need to know that God is with you and for you in Christ. He wants to help. He wants to cleanse you from any sense of shame that doesn't even come from anything you did. But He wants to cleanse you from that and help you in the midst of it. As a church, we want to help you any way that we can. So friends, don't be paralyzed by the past. Remember the example of Paul. Remember that Jesus is both propitiation in a payment sense and expiation in a cleansing sense. Jesus wants to help, and we do too. If we can encourage you in any particular way from a counseling standpoint in regard to this or anything else that we're talking about, reach out to us. Send us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com, and we'll help you any way that we can. Now, as we move on here in the passage, I also want to point out what he says here on the positive side. So he talks about forgetting that which lies behind, this functional forgetfulness. But then he also says straining forward to what lies ahead. And I mentioned this a moment ago, but let's drill down on this here. Again, O'Brien observes that this is a vivid word drawn from the game, so another athletic speech here. And it pictures a runner with his eyes fixed on the goal, his hands stretching out, stretching out toward it, and his body bent as he enters the last and decisive stages of the race. You can almost hear this. The, the, the shallow breathing, the crowd rising around, and he's straining toward that finish line. And what does he say in 14? It says here that he's pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Now, what is the upward call here? Now, this is a little bit debated, but generally speaking, he's talking about something in the constellation of salvation. Some people will go all the way to say, hey, he's talking exactly about heaven. Other people say he's just talking about pursuing Christ. Whatever it is that he's saying, it's in the same rough box in which he is speaking. But I do think there is a good challenge for us, a good question we should ask ourselves here in regard to the way he talks about this. 
this straining, this everything being laid out on the line. And we need to ask ourselves, is that evidenced in the way that we follow Jesus? That's a hard question, isn't it? Because if we're honest, most of us are probably a little bit more laissez-faire than we should be about our pursuit of Christ. And then on top of that, sometimes even bad thinking comes along and say, oh, Dustin, you got to be careful here. You don't want to preach legalism to the people. Friends, this is not legalism. This is Paul sharing his own heart and saying, listen, this is how I want to follow Christ. I want to live as if what we know the Bible says is true, that this life is very short and eternity is very long. That Jesus is the most important person and pursuit in my life. And I want to follow him with everything that I am. And friends, again, it's important that we think about this the right way. Because people could say again, ah, that just sounds moralistic, sounds legalistic. Friends, Dallas Willard is a help to us here. Because he said, though Christianity is certainly opposed to earning... It is not opposed to effort. Isn't that a good counsel, a good balance, a good reminder for us? Certainly, we can't earn our salvation, but the gospel motivates us to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Paul taught us that in this very book. So we need to be straining, we need to be leaning in, leaning forward, following after Jesus with everything that we can, leaning on the community that He's placed around us, and seeing what only God can do in our lives. So let's let Paul's example here spur us on toward love and good deeds in this very way. Now, there's one more thing that he wants to tell us here, and it comes to us from verses 15 and 16. Take a look at it. It says, Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. But only let us hold true to what we have attained. So third and final point today, mature Christians are to walk in the way that Paul has described. Now again, we know Paul's not an elitist. Paul is a master at reading the room. And he knows, hey, he said some pretty heavy things here, but he also wants people to know that he is not some Superman on an island. He's not the only one that can attain this kind of pursuit of Christ. This is available to all of us. And also, I love what he tells us here about the heart of God. He shows that God is fully and irrevocably committed to our growth and knowledge. That he doesn't just throw Christianity to us like a you know, manual to a car that we've never tried to disassemble before. He gives us teachers. He puts us in a community. He gives us access to wonderful books and podcasts and the internet. And we have more knowledge available to us that can help us spiritually than any other generation of Christians in history. And he's saying, listen, we need to live up to what God has taught us. We need to live into the teaching that we've been given. We need to take advantage of all these resources in a positive gospel way. And we need to have the kind of perspective that he had for the glory of God, for the good of those around us, and for the good of the watching world. This is not superhero Christianity. This is Christianity. And God wants us to know that. He wants us to shepherd us in it or He wants to shepherd us in it. He wants to help us invest it in others. And He wants to do all this for the sake of His name. So let me ask you this question. The perspective that Paul has described, all that we've learned here, is this the way that you see Christianity? Is this the way that you are pursuing Christ Himself? Because if not, God might want to use this message today as somewhat of a kind and gentle corrective to call us more in the right direction, to lead us more in faithfulness to Christ so that we might be of even better gospel use in this world. So let's bring all this together. Where does it all come together? Friends, it comes together with Jesus himself. 
the one who took hold of us on our own Damascus road so that we might take hold of him. The one who comes along and offers us a truly unique reality to benefit from but not be paralyzed by our past. To not simply rest on our own laurels spiritually or practically in life, but to say that whatever lies out ahead of us in heaven is better than what we've known in the past. To also say to us that there is forgiveness for any sin that we've committed. There is cleansing for any sin that's been committed against us. Friends, only Jesus can make this kind of invitation. And then to see finally that he is committed to gently teaching us and guiding us and correcting us and shepherding us by his word. Who else could do any of these things for us but the Lord Jesus himself? Friends, no one. Do you know him today? Have you come to the place where you've turned from your sin and you've trusted in everything Jesus has done for you? His perfect life, his substitutes death, his glorious resurrection. Have you transferred the leadership of your life over to him? Friends, if not, let today be the day of salvation. He wants to save you. If you have, where are you most challenged by this passage today? Most convicted, most comforted. Friends, the Lord is speaking to us even now. Let's be sensitive. Let's be open. Let's be available for whatever He wants to do, even in this moment. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this time in it. We pray all this in Jesus' good name. Amen.
every breath. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew until I. Thank you for singing with us. Let me give us just a couple of announcements here. We'll be on our way. First of all, if you were new with us, thanks so much for being with us. We would love to know who you are and how we can encourage you further. Just shoot us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com, and we will be in touch. Also want to let you know that we are now also meeting on Sunday morning uh, at our typical location, Winstead Elementary here in South Franklin. Uh, we have a kids service that begins at 10. We have uh, a, a normal service for all of us at 1030. And there are many safety protocols that are being followed to, to make it safe for us to gather together. And if you would feel comfortable in coming out, we would love to have you. All the information you need is available at refugechurchfranklin.com, refugechurchfranklin.com. And you can reach out to us there and we will help and encourage you any way that we can. We've got community groups, kids ministry, student ministry, men's and women's Bible study. Everything that we had going on is happening now. So we'd love to invite you into it. Also want to let you know coming up this month in November, we are looking for our next practical service project. We believe that is going to be with the Prison Fellowship Ministry. Uh, there will be more information coming on what we're going to be do to doing, what we're going to be doing to partner with them. There we go, and we would love to have you uh, participate that uh, in that as well. So that being said, that's all of our announcements. Let me pray for us, and then we will be on our way. Lord, thank you for this time that we have to spend together today, at least virtually. May your word bear rich fruit in all of our lives, and that you would bring us back together again very soon. Go now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.